Good morning. Uh, I am Council Member Antonio Reynoso, and I am the Chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. Welcome to this oversight hearing about the Department of Sanitation's 2018-2019 draft snow plans, and we've been joined by Council Member Vallone. Uh, Local Law 28 of 2011 requires DSNY to submit to the Council a snow plowing and removal plan for each borough and to make those plans available to the public on the city's website. This hearing will examine the draft snow plans that the Council received from DSNYs pursuant to Local uh, Law 28 and the city's readiness for the 2018-2019 snow season. I know how hard the Commissioner and the whole department worked during the snow season, so I want to thank you in advance. Um, the SNY is not solely responsible for the snow removal, though. Businesses in New York City are also responsible for keeping sidewalks clear. We are hearing legislation today that will address the issue of businesses that don't properly remove the snow that builds up near their storefronts, potentially resulting in unsafe conditions. Intro number 619, sponsored by Councilmember Justin Brannan, raises the fines for chain businesses who receive violations for failing to properly remove snow, ice, and dirt from sidewalks following snowfall. I'm looking forward to DSNY, to hearing DSNY's thought on the, thoughts on these bills. I also hope to learn if there are any other ways that the department thinks we can encourage store owners to keep their storefronts and sidewalks safe for New Yorkers. I look forward to hearing from DSNY and other interested groups and individuals about the draft snow plans today. Thank you. Uh, and we're going to swear you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to answer council member questions honestly? I do. Thank you. So, please, Stephen Costas, uh, first deputy commissioner for operations, and still the uh, commissioner of sanitation, Captain Garcia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I apologize. We've also been joined by council member Cabrera. You ready to go? Good morning, Chair Reynoso and members of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste. I am Catherine Garcia, Commissioner for the New York City Department of Sanitation. With me here today is First Deputy Commissioner Stephen Costas. I would like to thank Chair Reynoso and the members of the committee for holding this hearing to discuss with you the department's draft snow plans and our preparedness going into the upcoming 2018-2019 snow season. In accordance with Local Law 28 of 2011, our draft snow plans detail the department's snow fighting procedures from planning and preparedness to implementation. The plans identify how we will allocate personnel and equipment resources in each borough and district, the coordination of services among agencies, and customer service protocols. We will consider all comments and recommendations received by elected officials on our draft plans, and then we will publish the final borough snow plans on the department website by November 15th. And just as an aside, I'd like to thank the council for all of the support we receive in making sure we're ready for the snow season. As this is the first snow hearing of this council session, I'd like to walk through a basic refresher of our snow fighting planning and procedures. While the department's workforce and its vehicles and equipment appear most visible in the public eye in the wintertime, the department's preparing and planning for each year's snow season is actually continuous throughout the year. Yes, we talk about it in August. Following each winter se snow season, the operations office performs a review and assessment of its response to all storms during the previous season. The department makes operational changes and adjustments, such as improving training and improving communications pro protocol as we deem necessary. In the spring and summer, agency staff review over 1,400 snow routes in all five boroughs and revise them as necessary based on the prior year's experiences. We also make adjustments for any changes that have occurred in the physical cityscape along a particular route, such as the construction of a new school or changes to traffic patterns, which seems to happen constantly. DSNY also performs preventative maintenance on all snow-related equipment and upgrades equipment as necessary. Also in the months before the snow season begins, the department ensures it has adequate equipment, parts, and supplies to carry out our snow plans. We establish contracts with multiple vendors to replenish our stockpiles of salt, and salt and calcium chloride are delivered to department storage locations located in each borough. Additionally, the department ensures it has sufficient snow chains on hand to have an adequate supply for the snow season. 
The department also holds winter operations training for sanitation workers from September through December each year. Training includes spreader operation, attachment of plows and chains, use of two-way radios, and the use of Magellan turn to route navigation. In total, this fall, our employees will receive a total of more than 50,000 hours of snow training. We also conduct a full-scale snow drill in late November once the night plow season begins to get everyone in snow mode. This important exercise involves all department divisions, including operational and administrative functions. During night plow operations, the department increases staffing on night shifts to ensure sufficient coverage for snow or winter weather. This year, the night plow season will begin November 13th. In order to formulate an effective snow removal plan, the department has designed its snow plowing routes into three classifications. Critical routes are comprised of highways, major roadways, bus routes, and areas around schools, hospitals, police stations, and firehouses. Sector routes encompass other streets and are laid out in a compact, efficient manner to eliminate redundant travel miles. Halster routes service dead ends and streets that cannot be serviced with a standard collection truck or salt spreader. The department maintains a fleet of small halster plows to provide specialized service to these narrow areas. During a heavy snowstorm where significant accumulation is expected, the department begins plowing the critical sector and halster routes all at the same time, thus providing timely service for all residents. The department began phasing in this sector approach in 2014, and we have used sector routes citywide for the last two seasons. Throughout the winter season, the operations office monitors weather forecasts through its contracted weather reporting services around the clock. When forecasts call for a potential snow event, the department issues a snow alert to inform our staff, other city agencies, and the public. Ahead of significant snowfall, the department splits personnel into two 12-hour shifts, one from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and the other from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. At the onset of a snow event, the department deploys salt spreaders to reduce the accumulation of snow and prevent the formation of icy conditions on more than 19,000 roadway lane miles across the five boroughs. <coughs> Throughout the duration of a storm, department field managers constantly monitor roadway conditions, equipment use, and variations in weather patterns. Our field officers report this information on an hourly basis back to their respective borough commands, which is then relayed to our operations headquarters. Salt spreading operations continue for the duration of the snowfall. Once the snow accumulation becomes greater than two inches, the department deploys its snow plows. Plowing operations continue until all the city's traffic lanes are passable. Following the completion of all roadways, we begin clearing bike lanes, bus stops, crosswalks, and other pedestrian infrastructure. In recent years, the department has acquired additional snow equipment to more effectively remove snow from narrow streets, especially during storms with accumulations over 12 inches. Thanks to these investments, the department now has a total of 695 large and small salt spreaders in our snow fighting fleet, as well as 41 snow melters. This fleet not only makes us better prepared to respond more effectively to large snowstorms, but it also improves our ability to respond to ice storms and other types of frozen precip precipitation where plows alone aren't effective. In addition, the department and Do It made Plow NYC available in near real time to the public and software developers through the city's open data portal. For the 2018-2019 season, the data will again be made available during snow events, with plow status being updated several times per hour. The department's snow budget for fiscal year 2019 is 97.8 million. The department has adequate staffing with more than 6,400 sanitation workers available to manage this winter's snow and ice storms, including 441 new sanitation workers inducted at a ceremony last week. We also have available approximately 300,000 tons of road salt stored at over 42 locations citywide with contracts in place to deliver an additional 600,000 tons as necessary. The department makes every effort to clear snow and ice from the city's highway streets and bike lanes as expeditiously as possible. But this can be an extended process when persistent or heavy snowfall occurs combined with falling temperatures and high winds. Because every storm brings different challenges which impact the speed with which streets are cleared, including storm intensity, temperature, time of day, and accumulation, 
We ask the public to be patient and allow department workers who are performing under tough and often brutal conditions to safely complete their tasks timely and effectively. I will turn my focus now to intro 619. As proposed, this bill would impose higher civil penalties against chain businesses that fail to remove snow and ice from the sidewalks. As currently required under section 16-123 of the New York City Administrative Code, the legislation defines a chain business as any establishment that is part of a group of establishments that share a common owner or principal who owns at least 30% of each establishment where such establishments engage in the same business or operate pursuant to franchise agreements with the same franchisor as defined under the New York State General Business Law. The bill would increase civil penalties for any chain business meeting the proposed definition to 500 to 1,000 for a first time violation and from 1,000 to 3,000 for a second violation with a 12 month period and 3,000 to 5,000 for a third or subsequent violation within a 12 month period. Clearing sidewalks after a snowstorm is the law. Property owners and businesses, large and small, have an obligation to make our sidewalks safe for pedestrians after a snowfall. Doing so is not only a legal requirement, but is also an obligation as a neighbor and community partner. We expect the same partnership and level of compliance from chain establishments as we do from mom and pop stores. I have heard from a number of residents, community groups, and elected officials about concerns that certain establishments, whether banks, office supply stores, pharmacies, or restaurants, routinely fail to clear their sidewalks. And many of these businesses are delinquent at keeping them clean in the winter months as well. We strongly support efforts to hold violators accountable, especially those that repeatedly fail to clear their sidewalks as they impede mobility and create dangerous conditions for New Yorkers. I look forward to continued discussions with this council on steps we can take to hold these violators accountable and keep our sidewalks safe this winter season. In closing, I want everyone to be assured that snow fighting is a core component of the department's mission and our workforce understands that their performance is critical to keeping the city functioning 24 by 7. As we approach the official start of the 2018-19 snow season, I'm confident that the department's workforce can and will respond quickly and effectively to any major snow event. I look forward to your input and suggested comments on our draft snow plans. My staff and I are now happy to answer your questions. I want to thank you for that thorough uh, testimony. It uh, answers a lot of questions that we would have related to uh, um, the snow plan um, and the snow removal here in the city of New York. Um, but I want to ask some questions related to intro 619. Mm -hmm. uh, how many violations are given to chain businesses for failing to properly remove snow, ice, and dirt from sidewalks following snowfall each year? Um, I'm going to ask the first deputy commissioner to answer those. Okay. Um, Let's see. Thank you. Uh, last year, we issued just under 6,000 uh, violations. Uh, it is goes under the code, so we don't have the breakdown to what portion of that were to businesses as opposed to uh, residential homes. Okay. So it's not separated because it's not mandatory in the city's law to separate between uh, residential and businesses? Correct. Okay. That's a re a Everyone reporting is responsible issue. to clear after a snow, regardless, of regardless of whether they are resident or business owner. I see, but do most of those violations go to the property owner or to the to the business? Uh, it would be written to the address. In some cases, it is a business. In some cases, it's the uh, residential property owner. Do many businesses get multiple violations? Is, is there a breakdown on whether or not one business, let's say, is receiving several throughout a snow, uh, a snow uh, days, a couple of snow days? Um, if the business did not come out and rectify the situation, they would be liable for another violation. And what about complaints? How many complaints does the city, I guess that's a 311 question, but how many complaints um, about the sidewalks <coughs> covered with snow and ice each year do, do you tend to get? Uh, I don't have that number at this time. Oh, thank uh, you. I'm sorry. Um, okay, there you go. So last year we received a thousand uh, requests due to uh, snow or ice for street conditions and 3,500 for sidewalks. So there were more for sidewalks than there were for the streets? Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's a reflection of your work? I, I, I'm going to take credit for that. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'll ask a couple more questions. Um, so, for, of course, Intro 619, the council member, Justin Brennan, who is introducing it, has a district where it's a rampant uh, ice and snow on sidewalks and just uh, 
neglectful uh, business owners. So this is an attempt to try to uh, rectify that. Uh, the the violations are 500 for the first offense, and it really is like the cost of doing business more so than it is something that uh, de-incentivizes folks from not doing the job that they're supposed to when it comes to clearing snow. So I just wanted to make sure that I noted that. Um, and now electric vehicles, my favorite. Um, how far along are we with this pilot or this idea, this this electric truck, um, and what are the plans for it? And in in relation to snow removal, can it hold the plow and so forth? Just want to generally talk about uh, the potential electric truck here by DSMY. Um, we don't have it yet. It is coming, and so I don't know yet whether or not. Uh, it will be put to any use during this snow season, but that's part of the reason we would test it, is to make sure that it can both pick up and compact garbage as well as plow snow. When are we getting it, though? What, do it, we have a no, timeline? It's a few, it, takes, it takes a long time to build a collection truck, so we, it's, the, it's a few months away still. Okay, well, before the end of the year, hopefully. Hopefully before the end of the year. Mac has not guaranteed that, though. We might have a hearing just on the electric truck, by the way. That might happen. <laughs> Th that's, that's fine. Um. According to the MMR, 2018 MMR, it seems like we've decreased the cost of, of snow removal per inch. It, it, it shows that you had 3.2 million in fiscal year 2017 and 2.5 million this year. Um, are we just being more efficient, just uh, uh, cost effective? Why is it that it's cheaper now or more affordable now to handle snow than it was, let's say, in 2017? Let me do that. Yeah. Um, it's, it, that is, I would say that's not a terribly good metric because the amount that it costs us per inch is very dependent on the storm. So if I have a whole lot of little storms where there's not a lot of accumulation, I'm still going to put people on overtime. I'm still going to salt all the streets. And if we have one big storm that's 20 inches, uh, you're not gonna, you're not necessarily gonna be doing it for longer than if you have to do it for 10 small storms. So 10 small storms are probably gonna cost me more than one big. So you ju it's just the metric doesn't necessarily add up, I guess. Yeah, I don't actually think that it's terribly useful. Yeah. Thank you. That'll be the last time we ask that question. <laughs> um, I wanna allow for uh, the our council members ask questions uh, and make sure that they um, they can get to where they need to get to. I want to ask uh, Council Member Valone first, followed by Council Member Cabrera. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Commissioner Good morning. and staff. Um, just a couple quick things prior to the to the bill. Um, in the testimony, I always take a look on the things that you bring to us. The department makes operational changes and adjustments. Um, based on the previous season and you get together on it. So are there any upcoming changes based on last year's snow season that you foresee for the boroughs of the city in general? No, for the most part, uh, the changes that the, commission, the commissioner mentioned uh, relate to uh, route revisions to make them more efficient just based on traffic flow, construction, uh, new construction that might affect our ability to navigate the, the streets. So if uh, the local district comes back and has a recommendation, um, our operations unit will put it through the test to see if it does make sense, and then we will implement that. And that's an ongoing thing. That always happens every year. And your department's great at getting out to us when we call. We appreciate that. I think probably one of the consistent themes for a driving district like ours is that treacherous time between prior to two inches may never reach to two inches. It then rains and sleets, because the city's famous for that, that change over time, and it's just a very difficult time. Maybe it's not plowing time, but there's a dangerous condition on the roads, and that, that tends to hit Northeast Queens more often than not, because that's just where we, where we reside, next to the water. We're further out east, and any time the east is targeted, I always put the warning bells out for Northeast Queens, because Nassau and Suffolk is going to get hit, which means to me, Douglas and Bayside, Whiteside. So is, is there any changes on that operational standard of prior to plowing, what we can do for salting and sanding and maybe getting to those roads that are not going to be plowed, but maybe need an additional help. And that's not just my district, that's throughout the city. So uh, anytime we see the forecast heading in that direction where the temperatures are going to stay on the lower side and 
potentially create ICU conditions, uh, we're going to try and make sure that we are assaulting all our sectors right from the onset of the uh, snow coming down, as well as continuing with that. Uh, as always, our the biggest help is for the public to actually stay off the roads and give us an opportunity to do what we have to, so that once we do uh, make complete passes, the, the roads are safer and open for both pedestrian and vehicle traffic. So it's, a, it's assaulting and a, a grinding, and I know Commissioner was, came out to us and explained it, but that's, it's, it's the procedure is assaulting and then we assault again. So here's another question we get all the time. So with the portal that you open, what's the best way for someone who's experiencing that condition, whether it's in a local street or a main street, uh, and it's happening, and it's usually 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night where the shift is at, what's, what's your advice then for someone who has that issue in front of their house? Uh, we're coming. Uh, we will continue to rewrite the uh, continue to reride the routes and make sure that they are down to blacktop as close as possible, and they can call three one one, and they can also obviously put in a complaint there. But well, we it's monitor. Not so a complaint. I think it's just noting, hey, I have a condition a in front of the house, right. and, and we need to get um, schools. You know, is always a, a pr priority for in the morning on a night like that um, to make sure that our crossing guards and our parents can get across. Part of our typical night operation in our second 12-hour shift will be also if we know schools are open the next day to make sure that we've uh, driven through them to make sure what might need attention so that uh, when the children get to the school, they have safe passage to the curb. So we do take that into account. Okay. And, and I appreciate it. I think that's always going to be our that, that tough gray area is that in between a large storm, it's kind of easier almost to, to prepare for that as it is the smaller ones that tend to cause all sorts Temperature of chaos play out by a, us. a key role in that. Now, on, on the bill, uh, I'm always one of those that hesitate to raise fines unless we have an issue. Um, this is raising first-time offenses also. But I, I'm always someone that thinks someone should get a grace period on the first time. But if someone is a, is a bad neighbor or repeat offender, I'm all in. Throw the book at. But uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts on first-time offenders and what you guys are seeing as if that's more of a problem um, but I, I'm not a big fan of first-time offenses um, I think that uh, it's been a long-standing practice that uh, we both residents and businesses have that responsibility to the public because of the potential hazard that it creates by not doing their responsibility um, the interesting part about is there the a warning procedure can that be used as it a discretion at all or is it it's it's there Boom, you're getting a fine. Uh, more times than not, uh, we're giving them ample time. Uh, at the end of a snowstorm, we will start uh, putting out the word that we will be coming around to uh, issue summonses if they have not done their job in terms of clearing the sidewalk. So, Do landlords get notice of any changes? Is there a notice requirement now to small businesses and larger businesses to say this is the city rules and regs, what they are today, and then they actually be changed? Uh, no. I think I'd find that handy because yeah. when I do run my small business, that's, that's I'm always curious as to what, what's happening and what inspectors coming. Um, that might not be a bad, if we do pass this law or just maybe give an update on, on current landlord responsibilities in New York, that might not be a bad idea. Uh, we currently have the code of digest, which does uh, also identify responsibility for businesses in terms of snow and ice removal. Is that given to them? Uh, well, we hand it out at, at events or when we're out in neighborhoods, but we can certainly provide it to your community. Um, so we have, a, I would say, a prettier sort of high-level flyer, and then we have the more in-depth code of all of your responsibilities as a business owner. But um, I'm going to well, be well a little probably bit... probably made a notice requirement. If we change this or anything, it's probably not the end of the world, whether it's online, through mail, or something. So, but th so I would just put it out there that I think snow and ice is different. Because snow and ice, the one thing that happens when you end up with snow and ice is that people actually get really hurt. They fall pretty easily on ice. I mean, I ended up with uh, one of my senior staff was walking to a meeting and someone hadn't done the sidewalk. She fell, she broke her hip. Um, so I feel like this is not an area where we want to have, oh, you need a warning. You really, you get four hours after the last, like, you know, in the morning or in the afternoon, before you ha we are going to come and find you. But it is really something that we think is important that gets done. This is a heavy pedestrian city, and it's it also is, an older there's city. There's always examples. There's always 
scenarios, and I get them all the time, where maybe it's you own a business, I own a business, she shoveled, I shoveled, she, she did it the other way. Clearly, you're going to do better than I am because that's the way it's going to happen. Uh, the, the snow plow came and covered the, pl the sidewalk in front after I just shoveled. There's, there are exceptions, and I, I don't think this allows for that. Um, and, and I think it's just the nature of being a small business owner in the city where we're constantly, I know this has changed, but it's also the plight of maybe the inspector goes out to differentiate between a chain and a small business. Maybe someone's got six stores, maybe you got seven, now I'm gonna give them the fine anyway. I, I, just, I just want there to be a notice, some caution, and obviously if there's a repeat offender, then that's not the person we're talking about here. I've never, but sometimes it's the repeat offenders that punishes all the other folks that get stuck with, hey, how did I get this fine? I do everything, I get up at six in the morning, I have a, I think we just have to be conscious of the balance, that's all. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and, I, and I'll bring the, those concerns to Council Member Brandon. Maybe we maintain the first offense at the same level and then just subsequent ones uh, increase significantly um, to, to help address that, um, and, it, and it gives them that information. Maybe maintain it at 500 and not go up to 1,000 and then just make the other ones slightly higher. Um, I'll definitely bring that to, to, to the, the Council Member. Um, as all of our bills, they're never, never written in stone until they're actually written in stone. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing what his thoughts on that are. Um, we've also been joined by uh, Council Member Deutsch from Brooklyn, uh, but I'm gonna have Council Member Cabrera ask some, some questions. Uh, thank you so much to the chair, and, and uh, let me just echo uh, my support also for the, the first offense uh, to be kept uh, 500. Uh, Commissioner, first I wanna thank you. Uh, I wanna thank you because last year you guys did a phenomenal job in my district. Uh, and also whenever we call upon, uh, there's a quick response. Uh, if there's a particular street that needs um, added attention. So thank you for the great job. Uh, I have several questions. I, I know that I've been hearing the, the weather forecasters are expecting uh, less than wintry snow uh, season. Does that affect your decision making in terms of how much salt uh, do you buy? Uh, can you, I know you have some storage. I see them sometimes when I'm driving. Uh, do you do you put them on re reserve, knowing that you could buy some more quickly? How how does that work? So currently we have about three hundred thousand tons of salt in That's stock. That's it. Not just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we have. Uh, open requirement contracts that enable us to purchase an additional up to 600,000 if necessary. So uh, we like going into the season fully stocked at all of our locations. And then after every event, we then have deliveries being made to try and always keep that stockpile going. And how much snow do you need, uh, do you need per average snowstorm? <coughs> I, uh, I don't know what the, the number for last year was about. So the, the, the so just to put in perspective, on average, the city receives a, in the high 20-inch range of snowfall. We had 40 last year. Um, so And it didn't end until April. But just to also put it in context, believe nothing that you read from meteorologists until it actually happens. Gotcha. Um, and so our um, the way that we think about going into a snow season is that we will assume that the worst will happen. That's good. I'd love to hear that. How many uh, of the tickets, get, do the, the tickets go to Oath, right? To ECB. Okay, so how many of those tickets get dismissed? Um, I don't have that number on the top of my head, but on average, uh, about uh, in the high 80s of ours are, are upheld. Okay, um, when somebody gets a ticket, are there pictures that are taken? No. Or? no. So it's one word, I mean, somebody says, say, I mean, how do, how do we know that the business owner didn't take a picture after they shovel and then they go to court and they say, hey, you know, I cleaned it, maybe they went to the wrong business? I, I, I don't know how they, what, their, what their defense is of their ticket, but um, you know, we go through the same procedure as we go with any other enforcement action is the enforcement agent uh, will write the ticket and it is based on their visual representation of what they see. Okay. Uh, what's the average time to respond uh, to a complaint during a snowstorm? They say, hey, my street didn't get plowed. Uh, they call 311. Um, 
we're trying to get to every street uh, and run through the routes in a two-hour segment. Uh, completion time is not always that based on weather conditions, but we certainly uh, do try to address everything and continue to readdress them as once we've completed the routes. How many uh, of your tickets are first-timer versus second-timer, third-timer? Do you have that data? I do not. I do not have that data. Can you get us that data? Yeah, sure. I, we can that follow would be kind of interesting. Uh, I'll see whether or not we can pull it. I don't. I'm, I'm assuming that that is something we can pull out of the databases, but we are right. happy to provide anything we have. I'm sure uh, also Oath could help with that. Cause yeah, EC, it all goes into the ECB uh, computer system. Uh, how would, uh, and I'm asking because I really don't know the answer to that, how would an inspector know if it's a chain business? So, I mean, just in terms of that, we wouldn't know today. So if this bill moved forward, we would have to do some back-end data uh, collection so that that information would be available on their handheld. Gotcha. Uh, how, do you, how do you determine, uh, and this is my last question, the distribution of trucks, how many you put in the Bronx versus Staten Island, Manhattan? You know, every borough always thinks that they don't get enough, right? I always say Manhattan gets the most. Uh, no, uh, we do an, an equitable, equitable breakdown based on mileage per route. So uh, each location receives fairly an equal number of trucks to the mileage for that area. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much, and uh, thank you for all the hard work uh, that, that you do, and looking forward to another sequel uh, to last year's uh, thorough cleanup, uh, snow removal. Thank you so much. Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Cabrera. And just a uh, heads up, there is a bill that has been introduced related to uh, having proof uh, by inspectors or supervisors of whether or not um, there's trash or uh, snow removed uh, from, from a person's property. Um, I'm hoping that with uh, supervisors and handhelds, that might be something that we could operationally do in the future. There are no cameras on the handhelds. Well, we'll get you some cameras. Well, and you, I'm not you, saying you're, I'm supporting you're, you're, the bill. I'm just saying OMB's ears. This, is, this is, by the way, that, that conversation has been something that runs through the city council uh, constantly. It's not something that's you know left, right, Bronx, Brooklyn. It's across the board. Mm -hmm. Folks really feel that it's hard. Uh, my word against yours, and it's almost like the inspectors will, um, will always win. Um, and just some type of proof that there is uh, debris and so forth um, would go a long way to making people feel like it's justified. Um, and um, uh, we'll see if we hear that bill in the future, but we want to talk to you about it before we do that um, to make sure that you feel that there's operationally a possibility to happen. But we're on to it, Councilmember Cabrera. We have uh, Councilmember Deutsch, and we have been joined by Councilmember Aspinall from Brooklyn as well. Thank you, Chair, and congratulations, Commissioner, on another role. So we all know you can multitask. So congratulations on Thank that. You. That's very good. That's very nice to hear. Um, so I want to ask you firstly on pedestrian islands. Um, so pedestrian islands were implemented by Department of Transportation to uh, make it safer for people to cross over the, the streets. So uh, firstly, do you know how many pedestrian islands there are in New York City, number one? Number two is what are your plans during the snow season on uh, for pedestrian islands? And number three is that once you tell me what your plan is, do you think that is effective? So uh, I do not know the total number of pedestrian islands that are currently have been installed. Uh, we have a regular communication back and forth with DOT. Uh, we are meeting with them actually next week to go over the most recent ones that have been installed to uh, ensure that they've given us enough uh, lane width for us to be able to pass through with a plow. And uh, that's an ongoing conversation that we have with them to make sure that we're able to, you know, easily navigate the road. And yeah, then in, in terms of clearing uh, those, those would be, <coughs> after we have completed the streets, would be in the same tier of uh, bike lanes, pedestrian overpasses, step streets, and so we use a combination of our skid steers as well as uh, shovels, depending on what, what we have available. So like, um, how effective do you think that is, like after a snow, um, when the snow, um, uh, if the, when this after the snowfall, like how soon after that, 
do you clean those areas, and what is your manpower on that? It's going to because I see that the, the bus stops, you know, with all the new SBS buses and everything, that you could stay there for until the summer, until it gets warm and everything melts. So it's not that effective, but is it is it a question with manpower or like what are your plans on maybe increasing that manpower throughout the city because you don't always get enough people to manual labor um, over the winter months because I know that we all get complaints uh, throughout the year with especially for the bus stops. Well, we d we usually do not do the bus stops. That is done by a DOT contract. Um, but in terms of any of the quality of life is what we determine. It. It's going to very much depend on where the temperatures are and what the amount of snow is on how fast we are. If it turns to ice, we are significantly slower than when it is white and powdery. Um, but we will stay on it until it is complete, and we will hire snow laborers should we need them. Um, that registration has already started at all of our garages and online as well as at DOT garages. So what is the difference between the pedestrian islands and the MTA stops, that one is uh, contracted through DOT and pedestrian islands are not? Uh, because that was part of their contract with uh, the bus stop, the shelters. Uh -huh. um, okay, uh, on another note. We um, still do the bus stops that are not shelters, and, we'll, and we will attack all the crosswalks as well. So crosswalks sort of in are the same as pedestrian islands. So what, what would the response time <coughs> be if, uh, if we call 311? On a, well, we would probably, that would not be prioritized over a street uh, condition. So it's going to be very dependent on where we are within a storm. Okay, I, that's. I, I think that uh, we definitely need to figure that out because it should. They should all be the same. Ice is ice. Uh, they don't discriminate. Um, secondly, um, you did mention that you have um, conversations with the Department of Transportation. So my question is, do they give you any unresolved ponding conditions that affect um, handicapped ramps, uh, the areas that they they usually it takes them quite a while to fix any ponding conditions. And I'll give you an example. In my district, uh, on East 18th Street, Bay Avenue and Avenue M, there's been major, major ponding conditions there, and it still has not been resolved over the last four, four years. And every time, it, uh, um, every time there's ponding there and it turns to ice, it's extremely dangerous, and people slip and fall. Uh, it's possible that the local district, if it is an on ongoing problem, is aware of it and knows to already address it, but we'll certainly document that and make sure that the garage is aware. Great, if you could do that, yeah. And East Bay Avenue and, and Avenue M. Okay. Um, finally, I just have uh, uh, one more thing. Uh, we just raised uh, the fines on the legal dumping uh, not too long ago, um, which is great. If someone throws trash out the window, someone dumps illegal illegally on the streets, so the fines are raised, but without the manpower, the, the fact that we're raising the fines are meaningless because uh, we don't have enough enforcement um, to tackle and to uh, tackle those issues. Um, so we, we're talking about now um, the bill that uh, intro uh, 619 of raising the fines um, to, uh, to chain stores, to, to, to commercial stores. But do you have, do you feel you have um, a sufficient amount of uh, agents that can go out there and tackle all, all the complaints that you receive or and be proactive to, to check out these stores? I mean, in, we have a larger force of enforcement agents than we do for, for the illegal dumping complaints. Um, and so we do think that we have the capacity after a storm to be able to write summonses against folks who do not shovel their sidewalk. Uh, how many people do you have for that? 250. Two. About 250 people. So 250 who write summonses. Who would write summonses. It's different than people who write the illegal dumping. Oh, so it's a, it's a different. It's, uh, a separate, okay. it's a separate union. Um, okay. Um, I think that is it. You just follow up on those questions. Okay. And uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Deutsch, uh, and I just have a couple more questions. I, we actually do have someone who wants to speak um, shortly after this. Uh, just in, reg in, reg in regards to the training 
that happens right before the snow. I think some people already saw some trucks with plows. So can you just speak to what's happening there so that people don't freak out? Um, uh, we I don't think we even got winter fall. It was coming. like summer straight to winter. Yeah. Um, and when they see the plows, they get nervous. Can we just talk about what that training is and so, what's happening there? Yeah. Okay, so basically what we started is on Sundays. Uh, we've been doing two different shifts with an average of 800 people per shift getting training. Okay. And part of that training as the commissioner mentioned, is actually going over the basic operation of the salt spreading equipment, uh, making sure they understand how to uh, put on a plow, put on chains. Uh, then we actually give them instruction on the new Magellan units that are in the spreaders, mm -hmm. which will uh, help them with turn-by-turn -turn direction on their routes. Mm -hmm. And then we actually send them out to the street so that uh, they could ride the routes and get familiar with them within the district that they're assigned. And then at the end of the day, when they come back in, we go over with them in terms of progress, uh, how they were able to navigate. And if there are any questions, then we go over them at that point. And we do that for all sanitation workers that are assigned to the field. They all attend it. And the Magellan units are new this year? Uh, the Magellan units are now outfitted with turn-by-turn -turn direction, so uh, which is a nice to have for the individuals who potentially might go out of town and not be familiar with an area that they're working in. So instead like of them having to pick up a route. It's for those of us who are like from Brooklyn where there are grids who get sent out to Eastern Queens where there are not. Um, we can say this all, this is all about Queens, I, I know. Because <laughs> with the 60th Lane, 60th Street, 60th Avenue, and 60th Place, we get it. Yeah, it's very, it's very challenging alone. for those of us who are not um, born and raised in Queens. Yes, it is. Uh, I don't know how anyone gets around Queens. But, but the Magellan, we, so we had them in our spreader fleet last year. We expanded it to all of the plow fleet. Okay, that's, um, how, how has it been so far with the first round of trainees, I guess, and the turn by turn, is it, does it look like it's something that's been helpful? Uh, it's been positive feedback. I think the, the workers are happy to have it. Uh, as uh, if they're not familiar with the area, obviously it's, uh, it'll be a huge help for them. Well, I, I have uh, the rest of my questions were answered during your testimony, so I really appreciate that. So I think we're, we're good to go, unless there are any more questions with, from the council members. Doesn't seem like there is. So thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, thank Deputy you. Commissioner. Appreciate your time. And we have one speaker related to uh, intro number 619, uh, Laris Mando Mandoker. Um, if you could come up. Okay, whenever you're ready, you can begin your testimony. Uh, is the red light on? Is the little red light? Now go. Yeah, now just pull it towards you a little closer to zoom out. There you go. Okay. Chairperson Reynoso and members of the committee, I represent NIMRA, the New York Metropolitan Retail Association, an organization of national chain retailers with stores in the city. Thank you for providing us with an opportunity to discuss this bill with you. Administrative Code 16-123 requires a business having charge of any building abutting a street where the sidewalk is paved to remove snow, ice, dirt, or other material from the sidewalk or gutter within four hours, excluding the period from 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. 
if the snow and ice is frozen too hard to remove without damaging the pavement, the business is required to strew ashes, sand, sawdust, or the like on the sidewalk. Violations are punishable by fines up to a maximum of $350, imprisonment for up to 10 days, or both. The city can also remove the snow ice or dirt and charge the business for the cost of the material. Apparently, the sponsors believe that the current level of fines is insufficient to deter violations of Section 16-123. However, and this is very significant, no data has been presented to this committee. No data has been issued. No data appears even to be available that would demonstrate that chain businesses such as NIMRA's members are the source of the problem as opposed to schools, universities, hospitals, government, or even other large non-chain businesses such as operators, managers of large office or multifamily buildings, hedge funds, investment banks, large cap public corporations, and the like. NIMRA's members are retailers. Retail is the fourth largest source of jobs in the city following financial services, health care, and professional technical services. But unlike those sectors, our jobs are open to all without years of training and certification and no educational barriers to prevent a stock clerk from rising to the highest level of management. We make money when our customers, your constituents, have access, safe access, to our stores. It is, to our, it is in our interest to keep our sidewalks clean. All of your constituents are our customers. We are forced to operate on small profit margins that are sensitive to every cost and expense that government and the market impose on us. Either we pass the cost on to our customers or we lay employees off in our brick and mortar stores and increase online operations. We've been warning about this for years and it has now come to pass. The cost of this bill will fall on our customers, your constituents, the city's taxpayers, and our employees, also your constituents. Intro 619 will unduly burden NIMRA's members without having a correspondingly ameliorative effect on the problem the bill purports to address. Accordingly, NIMRA opposes adoption of the bill. So thank you for your testimony. I just want one portion. So if we don't raise the initial fine and we maintain it the same and increase every subsequent fine, um, then we're really going after the what we would consider the, the bad players or the people just not doing the job or the work. Um, and this is also uh, a cost that is, ex is preventable, right? Should they do their job, it should never be a problem or a worry for any business um, if you plow um, the, the snow or if you remove the snow from your sidewalk. But it has a significant, significant effect to pedestrians um, uh, when they're moving about the block. So I just want to know it's preventable. It's very dangerous if it stays the same. If we maintain the original fine at 500 and increase every subsequent fine, we're only really going after the bad, bad players. Um, what your take on that is? My take is that you're conflating chain retailers with bad players, and that hasn't been demonstrated. You want to go after bad players, go after bad players, but identify who the bad players are and exclude people who are not bad players. That's the only problem that we have here. If there was data that showed that retail chains are the ones that are causing this problem, and you had to tell them, the, the commissioner, she's a great commissioner. They don't have any statistics. The tickets go to an address. They don't know if it's a business, if it's a residence, if it's a first offense, if it's a second. Nobody knows. It's all anecdotal. And 
I have great respect for Commissioner Garcia, but when she says in her testimony, I've heard from a number of people that there are chains that don't uh, 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 clean their sidewalks. If I were ever to tell you, some, testify something like that, you would skin my hide for, uh, you know, using an anecdotal uh, uh, data, if I could call it. So right. that's my problem. Okay. It's a good, I think this bill is well-intentioned, but it's too broad and under-inclusive also because you're not going to solve the problem because it doesn't really address the problem. Okay, well, I don't know if anyone else has any more testimony. Uh, yes, yeah, Councilman so Deutsch? Yeah, thank you. So I just wanted to explain to you, um, I have a number of chain stores in my district. And um, the mom and pop stores, if I walk into a store, I could either find a manager that cares or a, I could find the business owner because the small, the small mom and pop stores. When I walk into a CVS or a Rite Aid, they don't care. Um, they're not paying the fine. And it's very hard to actually contact someone who's responsible for that chain store for me to explain to them that the sidewalk needs to be clear. So, you know, if I had an easy time getting a hold of someone in a chain store and say, listen, your sidewalk hasn't been shoveled for two days and it's all icy, and then they would come out and do something about it, that's one thing. I cannot get a hold of anyone who runs a chain store who's, who's gonna take responsibility. It's just like when you have a shoplifter in a, in a chain store, um, they usually let the shoplifter go because they don't want to do anything in order to stop or risk their lives or try to stop someone because it's a chain store. Um, you know, it happens, cost of doing business. Um, the $500 fine is the cost of doing business. The $5,000 is hurts, hurts your pocket a little bit and then someone might care then. Um, so the difference is, is that um, a mom and pop store, I'm able to contact someone, to find someone to come out there because they don't want to get hurt with the fine. And the chain stores, you can never get a hold of anyone. You try. Pick up your phone now. Try getting a hold of someone in the chain store that really is going to give you answers. I suspect that I would be able to do it, but that's because it's me. Exactly. Well, I just wanted yeah. you to say that for the record. Thank but, you. But, but... I can't comment on your individual experience, and I don't doubt your individual experience at all. But our people, when I talk about, because I don't represent a single chain, I represent a bunch of them. This is not how a store should be run. There should be a manager here who would want to keep sidewalks clear and safe. Exactly, and if because that, and that's if that how happens, we make money. And if that happens, like the chair mentioned, then you won't get a fine. And so, therefore, the issue isn't a bill. The issue is for me to go back and talk to the CVS CVS people and say, you know, we're getting this complaint from a distinguished council member that people complain about snow and nobody uh, nobody cares, nobody responds. That should be the... Well, is this the first time you're hearing of this issue? Yeah, well, me, yes, of course. Well, bad communication then, because I've been complaining, and if you haven't heard anything from my district that's coming back to you, then there's a bad communication between uh, you and the people responsible. But again, keep in mind but that why I, does represent, it have to come to I represent an association. Yeah, but why does it have to come to a bill for you to come in here and to, and to defend them? Um, this should have been done a long time ago, this way this bill wouldn't have been drafted. But... Now that we're here and we have, we have the communication, we understand what the issue is, there is an easier way to solve the issue than this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Deutsch. Uh, Councilmember Cabrera. Thank you so much uh, to the chair. Um, I, I'm actually sympathetic to what you're saying. Uh, number one, there is no data. We heard that there's no way to distinguish. I, I think Possibly, I think the thought behind uh, this bill is that chain stores uh, can possibly ignore it uh, because 
$500 is not a lot for them. Uh, and so I think perhaps that's what I've heard, uh, you know, in, in, in discussions. So I think that might be uh, the impetus. But I tend to think that chain stores uh, have a bigger incentive to clean uh, than sidewalk. You mentioned one, which is uh, you want business. Uh, so the bottom line is to make money for those businesses. Uh, but I think even a bi perhaps a bigger one is lawsuits. Somebody doesn't clean their sidewalk, somebody trips, they're gonna get sued. I uh, would imagine chain stores, uh, well, first of all, they're a big target uh, for lawsuits. So I would imagine that would be an incentive. I, I, what I'm really looking for, uh, the chair mentioned earlier, and I, I do hope, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your leadership in this, that, that we do have a hearing on the pictures, on the camera, so it keeps it honest. Because right now, there is no way, uh, other if you have cameras in the front, uh, to, to verify whether they were clean or not. There's no way to verify whether they cleaned it, they're not cleaned it. And so I, I like to keep it on, just like we have police cameras now, and it keeps it honest both ways. I think this uh, might be a, a good way to go about it. Uh, I, and I do agree the first fine uh, should be kept the same. Uh, uh, but there is no data. I, I concur with you uh, to show uh, how many. We really don't know. Uh, I, I would imagine somebody who wants to take time could know. Uh, they could contact Oath. Uh, gather all the addresses of all the offenses uh, and be able to uh, determine, you know, where, who are the biggest, uh, you know, wh who's guilty here. Uh, maybe somebody wants to take the time to do that. And I think it might be worthwhile. So one of the things that I've talked about, you know, I used the word under-inclusive when I testified. And the reason that I use that is what would happen, here's a hypothetical. A bill passes, it applies to chain stores, and then it doesn't solve the problem because there are lots of other large business and large residential violators. And that's what I'm saying. If you're gonna put the burden on the chain stores, at least do it because you're gonna be accomplishing some worthy goal. To put the burden without accomplishing the goal, that's, that's really the message that we're saying to you. Don't do that. Accomplish the goal. Figure out how to accomplish the, how to accomplish the uh, uh, goal. Yeah, and, and there's no equity. I, I, there's apartment buildings here that are huge. They cover you know half a block and perhaps even a block. And um, they, you know, they, they cover perhaps a longer uh, space than you know small chains uh, of businesses. So uh, I hear you. I, I think uh, that we need to look into this bill and see how we could uh, have a more equitable way of going about it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cabrera. Well, I just heard you endorse uh, the, the bill if everyone gets the fine. That's what you want. That's what I'm hearing. So we want to be inclusive of all. We don't want to have not, no equity. So if I'll take that to Justin as, Brennan. As a matter of policy, whether you can raise fines so that it's a deterrent to l large scale violators, that's, that's not a concept that's unknown to uh, mankind. What I'm saying here is what you're doing is unfair because it's ineffective. Well, I really appreciate your time. I'm happy you came here um, and engaged with us. We'll definitely take all your testimony and all your uh, um, your, your testimony to Justin Brennan, um, and we'll look this over again and see if there's any opportunities for and we're a, a happy modification. To meet with him. Yeah, and I'll be sure to have your contact information here and be sure to let him know. But I really appreciate your time, Lawrence. Thank really you. Do. It's a pleasure. Thank to meet you me. very much for your okay. courtesy. Well, thank you all. Uh, and at this moment, the Committee of Sanitation is now adjourned.